Um, now, moving back to our paper speakers, because we started slightly late, I don't think there's time for another round of floor speeches. So, moving back to our paper speakers, we have um, Professor Paul Schulte. Having previously served as the Director of Proliferation and Arms Control for the UK Ministry of Defence and the UK Commissioner on the UN Commissions for Iraqi Disarmament, Paul is now a non-senior associate at the Carnegie Nuclear Policy Programme. Oh. No. Uh, yes, no, sorry, I thought I'd read the wrong one there for a second. <laughs> no. Professor, you have the ears of the house, and my apologies. Well, whatever my trick had passed, I'm properly delighted and honoured to be able to speak at such a world centre for humane rationality. And that's a big tribute for an unrepentant LSE graduate to me. <laughs> um, but it's double-edged, because I, I shall point out there are dangers in concluding or voting that the world will run according to the decent preferences of the Cambridge Union. And I'd like to start by complimenting the opposition in this. Um, I don't doubt their long-term personal commitment to the nuclear problem. They agree with me on its huge importance and its complexity, I think. I know they've, sp they've spent about as many decades obsessing about it as I have. And I don't doubt their horror about the risks and their emotional commitment to nuclear abolition. But I shall have fiercely and necessarily skeptical, skeptical things to say about the assumptions of nuclear elimination. Because nuclear weapons matter so much, their cultural and strategic impacts are continuous and they are profound. They don't just sit in silos and submarines until they explode or are scrapped. Their numbers, ranges, throw weights, deployments, declaratory postures empower or threaten or reassure. They change mentalities and they structure geopolitical space. As Schlesinger, the former US Secretary of Defense said, we use them every day. That's true of all nuclear powers. But the way their weapons are used can be defensive or aggressive, reassuring or coercive, restrained and open to good faith negotiation, or very evidently the opposite. So it's essential tonight to avoid the fallacy of the undistributed, undifferentiated we. So much depends upon the intentions and behavior of the states or the alliances concerned and the nuclear adversaries they face. Remember that loose talk of us may mean everyone, everywhere in the world, or treaty observant democratic status quo states like the NATO alliance and its nuclear protected regions like the Baltics or academic East Anglia or it could be US allies like Japan. Or does we also refer to revisionist nuclear autocracies rearming fast like Russia and China, or to their anxious and suffering neighbors? This liberal humane house ought to remember that as we elegantly debate here, Russia has been using its nuclear weapons first to enable and then relentlessly prosecute an aggressive and illegal war of colonial reconquest hundreds of thousands of deaths, more as we speak. By repeated threats of nuclear escalation, it is trying to limit NATO assistance to Ukraine. It has particularly well worked out very clever doctrines of cross-domain coercion, enabling its nuclear arsenal to offset Western conventional potential, which could tear apart the unexpectedly weak Russian conventional forces. This is called, in Russian doctrine, strategic deterrence. It combines formidable intercontinental and theater weaponry, nuclear signaling, relentless scary information warfare, and the compromise or bribery of opposing politicians and opinion formers. It's a very effective mixed strategy. It may win Putin his war on Ukraine. It may achieve, therefore, the subjection or death of 40 million Ukrainians. Please don't try to tell Ukrainians or Bolts or Poles or other threatened nationalities that available nuclear weapons are irrelevant and dangerous for them. And probably don't bother to try persuading Mr. Putin that he would have better options for his world vision by giving up his nuclear arsenal. So that's the actually existing world in which nuclear weapons are being used with astonishingly little international condemnation and considerable active support for their active misuse. My overall point, please take away, is that another world may be possible in which nuclear weapons would universally disappear. 
Nobody can permanently rule that out. We have to keep trying to recapture and reopen optimistic possibilities where we prudently can. But remember, that transformed world couldn't just be this world minus nukes. It would have to be fundamentally different in a countless number of ways. Yet our actually existing world lacks an international system which could create or support or guarantee those permanent necessary changes. Things are actually going the other way. The big open but unmentionable secret is that despite endless schemes, initiatives and conferences, no military, diplomatic, technical and legal architecture has been proposed which offers reliable, enforceable and irreversibly permanent nuclear disarmament. This is a huge, wicked collective action problem. No one knows how to solve it. The option then of a nuclear free world that you might want to select is, I'm afraid, no longer available, if it ever was. So that's an unpopular thing to say. I don't sense people want to hear this. It's a kind of blasphemy against the promises of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and endless UN resolutions or P5 statements. I can find it leads to pained, disapproving silences in large parts of Western academia. More importantly, if you say that publicly in international fora, it inflicts, inflicts reputational damage on your state. Any official, and that was, I was once one, from a nuclear nation or ally who publicly acknowledged that this was their private national judgment of possibility, they would face endlessly resounding accusations of hypocrisy. So it doesn't get said. The exception is, of course, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, who, with honest intimidation, state that, that the regime intends to keep their nuclear weapons forever, and who, who is to stop them. Acknowledging these realities doesn't mean you like them, and failure to confront them doesn't mean they disappear, but it does mean that you are crippled in your ability to manage them. We don't here have to talk in the watered-down prose of well-meaning NGOs, conference final documents, or UN reports. We can be more clear and honest than that. I spent lots of my professional life working on multilateral treaties to limit or ban weapons of mass destruction or prevent conventional war in Europe. I don't regret those years. It was worth trying in the hopeful situation of that time. But I don't try to hide how far things have fallen apart since the end of the post-Cold War honeymoon. In the actually existing world, I'd argue it's now intellectually dishonest, though it may be diplomatically necessary to anticipate widespread compliance from treaties to signatories. And the international community will do very little to correct that. This pattern ought to be unsurprising. It's part of an increasingly open struggle over world order. It happened in the 1930s when growing conflict in the international system broke treaties. Remember the Kellogg-Briand Pact? Probably not. And tore security guarantees apart. Now, in this current and imaginable international system, states lie, they cheat, and they never admit it, particularly about WMD. We, here, the whole world, saw evidence of massive eventual, offensive biological programs begun by the Soviet Union after it had signed the Biological Weapons Treaty, which banned them, but had no verification. It was revealed by defectors and reluctantly partially admitted by the Russian Federation, never convincingly dismantled. Their position now is it now happened. Don't talk about it. As Solzhenitsyn famously pointed out about your autocratic regimes in his time, they lie to us. They, we know they're lying. They know that we know that they're lying, and still they go on lying. He might have pointed out today that their allies and proxies and sympathizers and useful idiots seek to support and excuse them in this. So how much safer could we be by signing far-reaching treaties with people who we know will cheat? And on other areas, we should remember CW, chemical weapons, remember Novichok? That was started after the Chemical Weapons Convention that Russia signed in order to evade it. That nice Mr. Gorbachev signed that. Now it is used to try and kill the Skripals and Navalny. Uh, there's an ongoing scandal over Syrian chemical use that you may know. You may have noticed those children dying on camera with foam from organophosphates in their mouths. Um, that's undiscussable. The Russian position, it never happens. The Syrians never used it, ever chemical weapons against their own people. And of course, the Syrians are only happy to 
emphasize this, and this is blocked in the Organization for Pro Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. This is something the international community can't deal with. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. Treaty regime fragility is a thing. Think about that. Take it away with you. Treaties don't stay adequate. They erode. They get sabotaged. It happens. It has happened and would happen with an ambitious nuclear treaty. And that's where we are now. Belief in these treaties as a way out is less and less plausible. What are the chances of universal conversion to make treaties reliable? Who's going to make Pyongyang Yang? that Pyongyang allow a, a chapter of the international community of, against nuclear weapons. Um, what's going to change the calculus of the politburos around, around the world in China or Russia or, and, and, and the IRGC about the looming, perhaps inevitable, Iranian nuclear program? Uh, where will there be um, propaganda allowed to, to, to change people's opinion in those states, assuming they want to change, because nuclear weapons seem actually to be very popular whenever they're required. And the world is not waiting to be told to start thinking like well-intentioned, well-meaning Western NGOs. Um, just one final parting memory. Um, despite my boyish look, good looks, I wasn't old enough to be at Wood, Woodstock. I did see the film, though. It's worth seeing again and again. There is in that film a moment when this crowd who feel good about each other, who want to feel that they're living in a better and endlessly improvable world, see the clouds coming overhead. And their response is, they link arms and they shout, no rain, no rain. It's, it's charming. And isn't that where we are now with people who say, no nukes, no nukes. But it's worse because that didn't affect the heavens back in 69 in Woodstock. To say that now gives comfort to the information technologists and politicians and strategists in countries which are not much tempted by the non-nuclear option. So remember, if you vote this, what the implications are. You're voting to say you're willing to give all these things up in the sure and certain knowledge that there's no reason to believe that the Russians, Chinese, or name who, Iranians, whatever, are going to do the same. That's the worst possible message you can give to threatened nationalities like the Ukrainians and the Balts and who knows what to come. So with that in mind, I call on you to reject the, the self-defeating and demoralizing signal and therefore support the motion I've introduced. Thank you.